Hello. It's good to see you. Uh, Before we get started, I want to let you know about something that could be a really meaningful opportunity for you. Uh, The very last weekend of April, we're celebrating baptisms together as the church. Uh, Baptism is something that Jesus commanded all of his followers to do once they've started following him. Uh, But like a wedding ring doesn't make you married, uh, baptism, it doesn't save us. We're only saved because God has shown grace on us. And when we put our trust in Jesus, that faith saves us because of God's grace. However, baptism is this beautifully poetic, wonderful, public declaration of that trust that we've put in Jesus. It also represents everything that Jesus did for us, his death and resurrection. It also represents the transformation in our lives because of Jesus. So if you have never been baptized before, or maybe you're baptized as an infant and you want to choose to be baptized for the very first time, I cannot encourage you enough to do this. It would be so meaningful to you and meaningful to us as your church to support you and celebrate you in that. Um, If that's something you want to do, we're going to have an orientation uh, Monday night from 6.30 to 8 in this building, just a room over there. And uh, there's an information form you need to fill out. All of what I'm saying here, the information is in your newsletter. So uh, take a look at that if it's something that you want to do. I hope you do. And if you still have questions, we're going to be out in the lobby and ready to help you. Okay, so uh, let's get started. I don't need to tell you that the general feeling is, is our society has been undergoing some drastic shifts and changes and developments and has been reaching tipping points in a lot of ways. But amongst all this change that has been happening, I've seen something that has been very encouraging to me. Uh, Multiple times I've seen large groups of people come together, um, people who would not normally have come together before kind of the season of the past decade that we've seen. And they come together to stand up together against oppression and inequality and exclusion and social injustices, uh, whether that's because of race or ethnicity or gender or socioeconomic status. Uh, But they're coming together, these large, beautifully diverse groups of people coming together to stand up for people who have been mistreated and abused and neglected. And that's so encouraging to me because that feels to me very much in line with God's heart for all people, especially those who are being mistreated and abused. And it's happening in this wonderfully diverse way. So that being the case, why is it that for millions of Christians, not all, but for millions of Christians, Sunday morning is the most segregated part of their week. Is it okay that there is such a thing as an upper class church or middle class church or lower class church or homeless ministries on the side so those people have a place to go that's separate? Is it okay that we have a white church and a black church and a Latino church and an Asian church? Is it okay that we have broken ourselves up categorically based on what we disagree on by Lutheran or Methodist or Catholic or Evangelical or Baptist or Assemblies of God, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Is it okay that we have made it possible for us to choose who we want to worship with, but also possible for us to choose who we don't want to worship with? Something about that doesn't feel quite right. And division in the church is not a new issue. Just 30 years after Jesus had left earth, uh, Paul wrote a letter to a group of people who were following Jesus, who were feeling a significant level of division among them. And Paul could have shied away from that and pushed it under the rug, but instead he presses into it. And we see that in a passage in Ephesians. Now, just a little bit of context before we read this. Paul is talking to a group of Greek Christians who have, for a considerable amount of time, been mistreated by a group of Jewish people who are, are a group of them are also now Christians too. So this is in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 13, and it starts like this. Paul says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, there's a lot of context here that we need to quickly go over. Millennia before this letter was written, God spoke to a man named Abraham. And he told Abraham that Abraham's generations, his descendants would be God's people. And God would be their God. And he would never let them go. He would never abandon them. And God gave Abraham a symbol of this covenant that he made with Abraham for the men of his generations to carry. And that was circumcision. So for millennia, the people of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, they viewed themselves as God's chosen people, which they were. And they carried around this symbol with them. But the thing is, is there were some people within this group that took that status pridefully. And they didn't just see themselves as God's chosen people, but they saw everyone else as God's not chosen people and treated them as lessers. They looked down on them and they called them a derogatory term, the uncircumcision, which honestly today would be the weirdest insult ever. Don't use it. You'll only confuse them and make things awkward. But back then, it carried a lot of weight and a lot of baggage and it was very offensive. So Paul, he's talking to this group of Greek Christians, and for some reason, he's kind of stirring this up and pressing on the wound a bit, saying, remember what it was like to be treated like that. Remember what it was like to be called those names. Remember what it was like to be excluded from that group of people. But not just that, he, he tells them to remember what it was like to basically be cut off from God. He says, remember when you were strangers to the covenant of the promise because they had no idea God had made this covenant with Abraham. He says, remember that you were at time without any hope because without Jesus, we truly have no hope. And he said, remember what it was like to be in the world without God, because that was the reality. And that's been a reality that a lot of you have faced for a considerable amount of your lifetime, going through the world, being unaware of these beautiful truths. But Paul says, but now, because of what Jesus did for us, you are now included in God's chosen people. See, for millennia, Israel viewed themselves as God's chosen people, which they were. That is spot on. But then Jesus came, and he blew God's entire plan wide open, revealing that was just phase one. But phase two is that God actually loves the entire world and everyone in it. So anyone who would put their trust in Jesus and follow him can be a part of God's people, which is beautiful, and it's incredible. But at this time, that was a really big shift and transition that would be hard for a lot of the people back then to accept. Uh, four months ago today, my daughter Magnolia was born, and she is beautiful, and she is wonderful. Uh, but for our two-year-old son, Edison, this has been a lot to embrace and adjust to. And the thing is, when Allie was pregnant with Magnolia, Edison was totally cool with her being around. Like, we brought her around everywhere we went with us in the womb, and he was excited to be a big brother. And we did our best to explain to him, one day this baby is going to come out, and she will be out. And I don't think we did a perfect job at this, because here is a picture of Edison meeting Magnolia for the first time. And you can tell by the look on his face, he was not prepared for this at all. He's, what is this? Who is that person? And when did they go back with their parents? Um, so for a, a, quite a while, for nine months, there was a very real barrier between Edison and Magnolia. But when Magnolia was born, that barrier was gone. And all of a sudden, they both had the same status. For a very long time, there was a barrier between these two groups of people. And when Jesus was born, and when he completed his ministry on the cross, that barrier was removed, and all of a sudden, these two groups had the same status. And there was a lot that some of them had to adjust to when that happened. But the situation that Paul is getting at, it's much more complicated than just a baby being born into a family. This would be like if you and, and you had siblings and you spent years uh, picking on and making fun of the foreign homeless kid that hung out in your neighborhood. And then one day your parents tell you that they have adopted that kid into your family. 
For that family to be able to move forward, there is a past and there is a present reality that would have to be addressed before they could move forward. For this family to move forward, there is a past and a present reality of division that needs to be addressed before it can move forward, which is exactly what Paul is doing. And he goes on to explain how Jesus made it possible for them to move forward. So verse 14 and the first half of 15 Speaking of Jesus, Paul says this, For he, Jesus, himself, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Basically, Paul is saying when Jesus died, he removed any kind of separation or division that there was between these two groups of People And he made any laws that were in place at that time requiring a separation between these two groups invalid. They just served no purpose anymore. So in essence, Jesus made peace possible between these two groups of people. Now, that word dividing wall is a special Greek word. And it's not talking about a wall that you would find around a city. And it's not talking about a border wall between two countries. It's actually talking about a specific type of wall that was used as a partition to divide crowds of people by status or class or or back then gender. There was a wall like this around the Jewish temple at this time. And on that wall was an inscription written in Greek that said, any Gentiles who cross this barrier are responsible for their own death. That was the level of division that these two groups of people have historically lived with. And that was the level of hostility that some of them had towards each other. But when Jesus died, he brought those dividing walls down and all the hostility that comes along with them. What this means for us today is that any reason or any way that we would totally separate ourselves from another group of people who are also following Jesus are now simply invalid. There is no reason for them anymore. What Jesus did is he made it possible for anyone who followed him to be included into God's people. And with that level of inclusion, there can't be division. Because inclusion with division is not inclusion at all. And we know this full well. Look at what Jim Crow laws did to this country. Look at what apartheid did to South Africa. Separate but equal is an absolute farce. It doesn't work without creating second-class people or cultures or races that are mistreated and abused. And this can't happen in God's people. And that's the thing. We could talk for hours, which I'm not going to do, so it's okay. Uh, We could talk for hours about divisions that we see in our world, in this country, in society, politically. But Paul is talking about divisions within the church, the place that there shouldn't be any. And we need to talk about them too. Now, I would not assume that any of us here would intentionally create separation or division amongst anyone else who's following Jesus. But... Those separations are there, and some of you, if not many of you, might feel them or have felt them before. It's possible that maybe you feel kind of second class here because you just started following Jesus, and it seems like everyone around you has been following him their entire life, and they know the words and the verses and the songs and what to do on Sundays and Saturday nights. Or maybe you are part of an older generation and you feel second class because you've been told that your generation has nothing left to offer. Maybe you grew up in a church or were a part of a church that was so small that it was just unrecognized in your community and it felt like it didn't count. Maybe you were a part of a faith group or tradition or a denomination uh, and you were told by someone that that group of people had an incorrect perspective and understanding of God, as if any of us have a full understanding of who God is. Or maybe you grew up in a country or a culture or an ethnicity with a rich, vibrant worship of God and understanding of him, but because of the people you worship with, among them you are the minority, or maybe you're the only one 
and you feel like that what you have to offer doesn't apply here or it doesn't count or maybe it's even not appropriate. Maybe you feel these separations or maybe unknowingly you've caused someone to feel that way. Odds are really good that I have. And these separations, these divisions, even though they small, start small, these little cracks and these fissures, unaddressed, they can grow longer and wider if they aren't paid attention to. So our response to this can't be to just ignore it, but it also can't be to just put our past aside and come together in the same building and act like nothing ever happened and just try to get along. Because for as long as humanity has been trying to divide itself and categorize itself, Humanity has also been trying to come together and get along. And I don't think the level of unity that our souls long for and yearn for is possible on our own. But Paul is going to show us in the next couple of verses that Jesus has something far more ambitious and astonishing than unity in mind for us. And it's revealed to us in one word. So the rest of 15 and 16 go like this. He's still talking about Jesus, that he, Jesus, might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Now, that Greek word for one new Man, there are Bible translations that translate that to mankind or humanity. And the purpose of that is to make it more gender inclusive, which is spot on. Like what we're talking about absolutely includes women and men on an equal standing. However, this Greek word specifically means one individual person, which is important because it reveals to us just what Jesus is up to. Jesus doesn't want us to become united as a humanity, but he wants us to become so united and intertwined together that we go beyond unity and we become one, literally one. As a humanity, we have been striving to become one people, but in Jesus, we become one person, and that person is Jesus. Our human strivings for unity have worked from time to time, whether it's a peace treaty or a trade agreement or, or a merger or a contract or, or a ceasefire. But the thing about all these things is eventually they become unraveled. They, they are temporary. But what Jesus is doing is something far more beautiful and elegant and stable and permanent. And it goes beyond unity. What Jesus is creating in himself is oneness. If you go out to, if you go about to make a soup, you have your different ingredients. Uh, You have carrots, meat, potatoes, onions, and if you were to throw all these ingredients into a pot without a broth, they would just sit there and burn eventually. However, if you're making a soup and you put these ingredients into one broth together, something magical happens. Over time, as it simmers together, the flavor of the broth gets infused into the ingredients But the broth also allows the flavor of the ingredients to be infused into each other. So the carrots, the flavor of the carrots is infused into the meat, and the meat into the potatoes, and the potatoes into the onions, and the onions into the carrots, and now I'm hungry. And and they become one soup. And they haven't lost their diversity. Like meat is still meat, carrots is still carrots, onions still onions but they have just become more beautiful and complex and united in one soup. That is the power of oneness. In Christ, there are no second-class countries or cultures because there are no countries. There is only one kingdom. Inside the kingdom, there are no second-class denominations because there are no denominations. There are only followers of one, Jesus. And among the followers of Jesus, there are no second-class churches because there are no churches. There is only the church. And within the church, there are no second-class people because there are no people. 
there is only one person, and that person is Jesus. In Jesus, there are no second-class countries, only one kingdom, and no second-class denominations, only one, followers of one Jesus, no second-class churches, only the church, no second-class people, only one person, and that person is Jesus. To be one in Christ is like ingredients becoming one in a broth, with their flavors being infused into each other and the flavor of the broth infused into them. But if we were to be in Christ and yet divided, that would be like making carrot soup with a side of meat soup, with a side of potato soup, with a side of onion soup. And that's not what Jesus is cooking. The reason why Paul starts by kind of pressing into those wounds of divisions and is making us remember the pain that division has caused both back then and today, is to show us how backwards and contrary that is to what Jesus is doing and how far in the opposite direction it is from the direction that Jesus is taking us, his end goal. The most common word that is written and spoken in this passage is the word peace. Look, look at the last two verses we're going to look at, 17 and 18. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. When we think of peace, we think of words like calm or, or rest. Or we think of peace when something has come to a conclusion. Especially war. When two countries have been fighting and they stop fighting and they stay on their sides of the border, we call that peace. But that's not the type of peace that we're talking about here. So the Hebrew perspective of peace or shalom has so much more to do with wholeness or completeness. Peace is when something has become the fullness of what it was meant to be, when it has become one. And Jesus in the Bible is called the prince of peace, the prince of wholeness, the prince of oneness. And he has preached peace to those who were far and peace to those who are near, so that they could come together and become whole and have peace and experience oneness. Right before Jesus was betrayed by Judas, he was praying at night in a garden, and he was probably thinking about everything that he had said and done because his time on earth was about to come to a close. And he sums it up in a prayer that he prays for us. It's John 17, 20 through 23. So Jesus prays this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that's us, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you love me. May they become one so that the world may know. Can you imagine today in a world that is striving for unity how much oneness would stick out? How would the church change if we showed greater honor and respect to those who just started following Jesus because they can remind us of the things that we've forgotten? What would it look like for the wisdom of older generations to be infused into the freshness of younger and vice versa? What would it be like if churches and denominations didn't separate themselves based on the things that they disagreed on, but they humbly came before each other and opened themselves up to each other's understanding of who God is? Because no one church or denomination or group has God all figured out, and there's so much that we can learn from each other. What would it look like if we stepped out of our comfort zones and learned to worship and understand God like they do in other countries and cultures and ethnicities so that we can experience God in ways that we never have before? 
what would a church like that look like to the rest of the world? I believe that if we did this, we wouldn't realize what we could be, but we would realize what we already are. My son, Edison, he could spend his entire life trying to be an only child. It's not going to happen because that's not who he is. But if he opens himself up to his little sister, he will realize what he already is, a big brother. And part of him will become infused into her, and part of her will be infused into him, and they will be better because of it. A few months ago, I was walking around downtown Greeley, and I came across this homeless person. And I felt this unusually strong tugging inside of me to help this person out more than I usually do. And so I walked up to this person and, and I handed out the help that I had to offer. And I said something uh, almost uncontrollably that I don't normally say in those situations because I don't want to like shove this down anyone's throat. I told him, I feel like God wanted me to give this to you. And he, he looked up kind of surprised and he looked at me and he said, he keeps doing this to me. And I said, who? And he said, my father. And I looked at him and I said, are you a Christian? And with joy in his eyes, he said, yes. And instantly we realized that we were connected to each other. In that instantaneous moment, it's like we just all of a sudden remembered that we were old friends and we hadn't seen each other for a long time. We spent almost an hour talking about all the things that we loved about our father. I approached him thinking I had something to offer him, but he had so much to offer me. In our conversation, he said something that has haunted me since. I've thought about it almost every day. He stood there with his small collection of possessions right next to him. And with tears in his eyes and a smile on his face, he looked at me and said, the only thing that I am lacking is seeing God's face. I walked away feeling the poorer. I came to him thinking I had more, and I walked away jealous of what he had. Ten years ago, I had dividing walls up that would have prevented me from ever approaching someone like that. And I'm so glad those walls aren't up today because he ministered to my soul. And part of him was infused into me, and part of me was infused into him, and we were both better because of it by the time we parted ways. And that's what all this comes down to for me. Jesus is creating in himself one person out of all of his followers in him. Like it says in other passages, we together are the body of Christ. But what this means is anytime I encounter another follower of Jesus, they are not just a part of Jesus, but they are a part of me. And I am a part of them. And that is as challenging for me as it is mind-opening because I am so incredibly selfish. And this truth forces me to let go of the idea that I am entitled to be independent from everybody else. And I am not dutifully inclined to be there for anybody else. When we open ourselves up to this and we see each other as part of Jesus, but also a part of ourselves and ourselves as a part of each other, that's when the dividing walls will come down and we will experience oneness in him. Jesus has given us a practice and a gift that represents this so beautifully. It's communion, and we are going to be participating in that uh, tonight. Communion represents everything that Jesus did for us, but when we take the symbol of the body of Christ together, it represents what we have together, what we are together, the oneness that we have together. So we're going to take communion a little bit differently than we have before tonight. Uh, during this first song, Come up and pick up communion like you normally do, but just bring it back to your seat and wait. Um, 
because in a moment, I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to lead us in taking communion together. Father, as we prepare our hearts for what we're about to do, help the truths of what we've talked about sink into our hearts and our souls. So as we worship you and as we hold communion in our hands, we would realize the weight of it like we never have before. 